it is good to be with you today. And um, if you weren't here last week, last week we started a brand new series uh, called Make Room. And what we're doing throughout this series is we're looking at some of the characters of the Christmas story, maybe that are familiar to you. But as we look at them, we're discovering what we can learn about following Jesus as we look at their lives. What do we learn about making room for God to work in our lives? If you weren't here last week, we began the series by looking at the story in Luke chapter 1 where the angel Gabriel appears to Mary with a, a message that was pretty impossible. Here is Mary and he tells her that she is about to have a, a child. And the reason this was such an impossible situation is because Mary is a young teenage woman woman who is engaged or betrothed to be married and she's still a virgin right and and like we understand how this works that's an impossible situation that 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 defies the the laws of biology physics and everything else like it, it is not the way things are supposed to work and the angel looks at her and says what may seem impossible is possible with God and, and I love Mary's response she simply said yes yeah. she said I am the Lord's servant let it be as you have said and what we talked about as we looked at Mary's life last week is we looked at some character traits that Mary had that made her a perfect candidate to be used by God. The first thing we said is that Mary was a person who was available. She made herself available. She was open to God's divine interruptions. Right? She didn't get so caught up in her plan and what she wanted that she missed out on what God wanted to do in and through her life. She was humble. Right? She had humility. She answered that I am the Lord's servant. She understood that if this is what God wanted to do through her life, that she would humbly accept that plan. And she was obedient. She simply said yes. She did what it was that God had for her to do. This morning, we're going to look at Joseph. And as we begin this morning, I want to ask a question to you that hopefully will help you relate to Joseph's story. And that question is really simple. How many of you have ever felt in your life a little bit like invisible? Meaning not like superpower invisible, but you just kind of felt invisible. You felt maybe forgotten. You felt like you weren't that important. Maybe you're a, a quiet person who doesn't naturally like the, the spotlight and you're kind of a behind the scenes person and you're okay with that. You know that's just kind of who you are and, and your personality. But at the same time, there's times where because that's who you are, you just kind of feel like unknown, unseen. You know, the reason I, I start by asking that today is, is because I think all of us can relate to Joseph in that way, that, that there's times where we have these insecurities about ourselves, there's times where we, we don't feel all that important. And I don't know if Joseph ever felt those actual things. I don't know if he actually felt insecure. I don't know if he felt unimportant. But when I look at the Christmas story and I think about the Christmas story, oftentimes Joseph is kind of like the forgotten man in the story. Like there's manger scenes, you ever you set up like the manger scene and you're kind of not sure which one is Joseph, you're like this kind of looks like a shepherd, maybe it's Joseph, I don't know, you just kind of, like you know who everybody else is, but there's times where you're not even quite sure. We don't really know a lot about Joseph. In a lot of ways he's just an ordinary guy, like he's, he's mentioned, but we don't really know a lot about his, his life, uh, we don't have really any recordings of anything that he actually, he said. He's, he's just an ordinary guy. What do we know about Joseph? We can find out in the first few chapters of, of Matthew. We know if you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 7, uh, chapters 1, verses 1 through 17, you read what they call the genealogy of Jesus, but it's coming through the line of, of Joseph. And so we find a little bit about his history. But if we're honest, how many of you have ever got to like a genealogy in the Bible and you just kind of breeze through it real quick? Because you're like, it's just a bunch of names, right? And you can't pronounce them, so you just, here's the, but when you don't know how to say it, you just make it up, right? Just make it up as you go. And, and so you read through really quickly because you're like, I don't want to skip over this because that doesn't feel right. So I'm going to read it really quick, but I'm not going to really pay much attention to it. And so here's Joseph's kind of genealogy. And what you find out about Joseph is that he is a very distant relative of King David. Which is kind of cool, right? That's a kind of cool thing to be able to say to people when you meet them. Yeah, yeah, I'm the, the great, 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 like grandson of the greatest king in the history of Israel. That's a pretty cool thing. But the, the crazy thing about this is that the time from when they had a great king and they were this great nation that had a, a great purpose, powerful nation, that, that's a long time ago. It, it's a, a far time in the distance. That's a distant memory. There's no throne at this point. There's no palace that, that, that Joseph is, is getting to sit in and rule over. He, he comes from a small, we talked about this last week, a small, little, tiny, nothing village called Nazareth. He, he's not a king ruling over people with all this money. He's a, a carpenter. 
which is in a lot of ways at that time was just like a blue collar job. He wasn't rich. In fact, if you look at his life, he's probably much more on the, the poorer side of things. In many ways, Joseph was just an ordinary guy. And I think that's actually an important part of the story. Because what we see and what we learn from Joseph's life is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. In fact, this is a theme, if you read the Bible, this is a theme you'll see all throughout Scripture. That God is in the habit of using ordinary people to do extraordinary things in and through their lives. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31, it says, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise from a human perspective. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. In order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, for many people, we can go through the entire Christmas season, but think about the entire Christmas story and not give much thought to Joseph as part of that story. But what I want us to see today as we look at Joseph's life is that Joseph played a, a huge role in God's plan. That he was an ordinary man, but God was able to do something extraordinary in and through his life. And I hope that will be an encouragement to you. If you're one of those people who would be honest enough to say that, yeah, you don't always feel seen, and you feel forgotten, and you feel unworthy, and you deal with insecurities, that, that even if you feel like you're just an ordinary person, that you don't have a lot to bring to the table, I want you to understand that God is able to do extraordinary things through ordinary people just like you. This morning we're going to look at the Christmas story through the eyes of Joseph. Last week as we looked at Luke chapter 1, the perspective that Luke has written is through the eyes of Mary, her story. When we read Matthew chapter 1, it's more through Joseph's perspective and, and his side of the story. And so in Matthew chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to verses 18 through 25. We're going to be there in just a moment. But before we read these verses, I want to take a moment to just kind of remind you of where we were when the story left off last week. Mary gets this message from the angel Gabriel about having this child, and we said her response was that she was the Lord's servant, she was open and available to be used by God. And after she receives this message, she heads to see her relative Elizabeth, who we found out last week was also pregnant. It was another type of impossible situation, obviously different than Mary's impossible situation. This was a, a natural baby between her and her husband, but the thing that made it so impossible was that Elizabeth was around 70 years old. Like, she's never had a child in her life. She's been considered barren. She's probably given up on ever even thinking about having a child, and now she's pregnant at 70 years old. For some of you, that's like, that's not a miracle. That's a nightmare, right? Like, that would not be great news. But for her, it was, it was a miracle that even at 70 years old, she's about to have a child. She's about to have a son. They find out his name is going to be John. We know him as John the Baptist. He's going to have a very important role to play in preparing the way for the Messiah. And so Mary goes to visit this relative Elizabeth, who she knows is now pregnant. And the Bible says that, if you keep reading in the book of Luke, that when, when Mary shows up and she begins to speak to Elizabeth, the baby inside of Elizabeth's belly, John jumps for joy inside of her. And it, almost like she knew what was to come. The baby knew the miracle that had taken place, the miracle that was alive in, in Mary. The Bible says if you read on, she, she has this song of joy of how God has used her. And then if you read Luke chapter 1, verse 56, it says that after about three months of being with Elizabeth and Zechariah, she leaves. And so either right before John is born or right after John the Baptist is born, she leaves to go back to Nazareth. And that's where the story picks up today. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. Verse 18 says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they had come together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now I want to stop at that first verse for a second because I think sometimes we can read something and maybe we're so familiar with the story, we can read something so quickly and just move past it without giving it much thought. But 
I want to just kind of stop here for a second, and I want, to, I want us to put ourselves in, in Joseph's shoes for a moment. Like, just try to imagine you're, you're Joseph in this situation. And it's been three months since you've last seen your fiance, right? And the last you saw her, she was rushing out to go visit her relative. She didn't really tell you much about what was going on. She didn't tell you about why she was going to visit. She just said, I need to go visit my, my aunt Elizabeth and I'll be back at some point. You don't really know when she's coming back. You don't know anything other than she's visiting. So what are you doing? You're just going about life. Right? You don't have social media, Facebook, any way to really know what's going on in Mary's life. And so you're just kind of going through your life. You're preparing. He's continuing to work hard to prepare for being a great husband, to prepare for, for his wedding. Maybe he's doing a bunch of extra crunches at night so he can have six-pack on his honeymoon. I don't know what he's doing. But he is in preparation mode, preparing to be a husband and to live this life with Mary. And then she shows up after being gone for three months. And you look at her. And you can tell there's something different about her. Like you know there's something different. It's beginning to, to show that something is different about her. And your first thought is, she's been hitting them cupcakes real hard with her cousin Elizabeth. Or you're thinking the worst, which is she's pregnant. And that's what he knows. He sees that there's something different about her. And he knows that she's, she's pregnant. Now, we're on the other side of this. We have the Bible. And we know that this was a, a, a move of God, a, a work of the Holy Spirit. Matthew, the author of this gospel, knows that this is a, a work of the Holy Spirit. But you know who doesn't know that it's a work of God? Joseph. He doesn't know that this is God's work. All he knows is what he could see. And what he could see is that his fiance, the one he was betrothed to, which we, we said last week, was, was not just like an engagement that we see in our world today. This was like essentially being married. They were considered married. They had made a covenant together. They were considered husband and wife. Everything except for living together and being able to consummate, have sex. That was all that they didn't do. So they were technically married minus those things. And here is his fiance, and she is pregnant, and Joseph had nothing to do with it. He's thinking the only logical thing that he can think, that all of us would think, which is the woman that he loves, that he has been faithfully waiting for, that he has faithfully committed his life to, has been unfaithful to him. And even if she tried to explain it, do you think he would have believed her? Like, do you think, would you have believed her? Like, just think, if she showed up and she's like, listen, Joseph, I know I've been gone for three months, and I know you can see something's going on here, but listen, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. This, God did this, right? It's never happened before in the history of the world. There's never been a time where anybody's had a baby without actually doing the deed. But I just want you to know, I'm innocent. I've never done it. Uh, an angel showed up, right, and, and, and he told me I was going to have a baby, and now I'm with a baby, and this is all an act of God. I promise you I didn't. Would you believe that story? You'd think she was crazy and that she was lying. So here is Joseph, right? His entire life is thrown upside down. His plans of a, a wonderful future with Mary are thrown to the side. How's he going to respond? What's he going to do? Because listen, I know how I would respond. And I know what I would do. And if I'm being honest, it probably wouldn't be that pretty. It probably would not be nice. And if you're being honest about yourself, it probably wouldn't be great for you either. But how does Joseph respond? We see this in verse 19. What I want to do is I want to read the rest of these verses. And then we're going to take some time to kind of explore what we can learn about Joseph through these verses. So in verse 19, after receiving this news, this is what the Bible says. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David... Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This is from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, I believe. It says, see, the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Joseph was an ordinary man who God used to do and be a part of something 
extraordinary. And so as we look at these verses, as we look back on his life a little bit, I want to point out three ways that he was and that you and I can be extraordinarily ordinary. What does it look like to live an extraordinarily ordinary life? If you're here and you feel you're just an ordinary person, what does it look like for you to live an extraordinary life, to be used by God in an extraordinary way? What we see in Joseph's life, the first thing that we see about Joseph that made him extraordinarily ordinary was that he was a man who had developed godly character. He had developed godly character. The first thing we learn about Joseph in these verses is that he was a man of high character. Verse 19 says that he was a righteous man, which means that he was known as a man who did the right thing. He followed God's law. He lived according to God's ways. It means he, he wouldn't keep his business open on, on, a, on the Sabbath day just to make a little bit of extra money because that would be breaking God's law. He wouldn't eat certain foods because it was against God's law. He wouldn't have, be friends with certain people or live his life in certain ways. All because he was a righteous man who lived his life on God's law. And we learn in these verses just a little bit about his character. The first thing we see about his character is he was a man who lived by godly convictions. He had strong convictions that were based on the law of God, which this scenario was putting him in kind of a difficult situation, one of the classic between a rock and a hard place situations, because he understood God's law. He knew what God's law had to say. He knew what God's law had to say specifically about that, this type of situation. In fact, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 22, it's, a, it's a, a chapter that talks all about what do you do when there has been sexual immorality. And that's what he thinks has taken place. Adultery, sexual immorality, all those things. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 22, the punishment for this situation, if what he thinks happened actually took place, the punishment for that situation is, is to be stoned to death at, at at the worst, at the least, it was grounds for divorce. And it was grounds for public divorce, public humiliation. I mean, he could have made a public spectacle of Mary in this situation. And he had the right to because he lived his life as a righteous man according to God's law. He wanted to, to follow God's law perfectly. But here's the other thing about Joseph. Not only was he a, a man of high character that lived by godly convictions, he also loved Mary. He had committed his life to her. He was planning on, on being her husband and, and, and providing for her, taking care of her. He wasn't just a man of godly convictions. He was also a man of mercy and compassion. He didn't want to hurt her, even though he was hurt by what he perceived the her to do. He was hurt by her actions, yet he wasn't a, a vengeful person. And he knew he couldn't marry her, right, because he was a righteous man who followed the law. And according to the law, he couldn't marry a person who was an adulterer. I mean, if she had been unfaithful before their wedding day, what's going to keep her from being unfaithful? He can't go on with this wedding because he wants to follow God's law and he needs to live according to God's plans. But at the same time, he's, he's full of compassion and mercy. It, it, this is that where we see like a delicate balance between justice and mercy. He was trying to do the right thing based on what he knew the law said to do, but he was also didn't want to use this, this, this issue, this thing that Mary had done in his mind that Mary had done to seek out vengeance. I mean, he could have exposed Mary as an un, unwed mother to public di disgrace, to severe penalties. And a quiet divorce would have actually, it, it would have in some ways perceived, uh, it, would have, it would have kept her to at least save face a little bit. It would have enabled her to, to, to you know, deal with some of the consequences of her actions. Like she wouldn't have a husband, she would still have some, but she wouldn't have to go through the full extent of being killed, right? And so in his mind, this was kind of the best of both worlds. It was a way for him to live by his godly convictions and at the same time be compassionate and show mercy and do what he thought was best by Mary. Another thing we learned about Joseph's character is that he was a person who was was slow to anger. He didn't rush into making a decision uh, while he was angry, which I guarantee you he was not very happy when this whole situation played itself out. Like we read it, it's one verse, we think, oh, this is not that big of a deal. But let me, let's just be real. If it was you, if it was me, I don't think we'd be very happy about the situation, what we perceive is happening. 
But he's not a person who's ruled by his anger. He's not a person that's ruled by his emotions. And so what does he do? He, he takes a nap. Right? That's maybe the most spiritual thing we can do at times in our lives. When we're upset, when we're frustrated, when we're about to, to make a decision that's not good, he, he fell asleep. And I don't think he fell asleep just because he's like, I, I need to take a nap. I think he was emotionally overwhelmed. I think that the news of, of what he perceives Mary to do is, has completely shattered his life. And he is dealing with the weight of, of this, this action. And he doesn't know what to do. And he's frustrated. And he, and he doesn't know what the right decision to make is. But he knows that it's going to be a difficult decision. And he is just overwhelmed with emotion at that point. So much so that he's exhausted and he falls asleep. And while he is sleeping, an angel appears to him in a dream and gives him his instructions. And it made me think, what would have happened if he would have just allowed his anger to control him? What would have happened? How different would the story be if he allowed his anger to overflow to make a decision that he would later regret? Because I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever said something when you were angry that you regretted later? If you're married and your hand's not up, you're a liar, right? Or you just have a great marriage, you should be teaching us all a class. How many of you have ever done something that you regretted while you were angry? I think all of us have if we're honest. We've all had times where we've made a decision in the midst of, of, of feelings and emotions of anger that we want to regret. Yet we understand from scripture and from this, these portions of scriptures that, that godly character is character that is slow to anger. And not only that, but in James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it says it like this. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. For human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. I, I, I almost every single wedding I've ever done read that verse. Almost every single one. Because I feel like if there's one verse, a short verse in the Bible that is so simple and so practical, yet so hard to live up. But if you could just get that one right in your marriages, how many problems would putting that into practice solve? If you were just quick to listen, and you were slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And this is Joseph to a T. This is the example that we see him modeling. He is slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to make a, a huge decision. Why? Because he's a righteous man. And being a righteous man means doing the right thing, but it also means doing it the right way. It means doing the right thing the right way. Now, we don't know a lot about his character. We don't know a lot about his life. But in these just few verses, we, we see and we understand that he was a man of character and he was a man of integrity. And I think what we can learn from that is that if you and I are going to live extraordinarily ordinary lives, that this is where it starts. That it starts by having godly character, which what we see from, from Joseph's life started by, starts by surrendering your life to Christ starts by surrendering your life to God. It starts by making a decision, first and foremost, to live for, for him, his kingdom, his purposes. But it also is about building our lives on the foundation of his word. Psalms 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. By hitting your word in my heart that I might sin against you. Like who Joseph was, he lived his life in this way. He practiced what he preached. He was a man of godly character. He was a man who built his life on godly convictions that were based on his work. And I say all that to say for us, you don't have to be the most talented. You don't have to be the most outspoken. You don't have to be in front of every other person. What you need to be, though, is a person of integrity. And you want to live a life that is extraordinary, even though you may feel like you're just an ordinary person, then start by being a person of character. Start by being a person of integrity. Start by, by living your life on the foundation of God's word. Start by submitting your life to the lordship and the leadership of Christ as ruler of your life. We see this in Joseph's life. The second thing we see about Joseph's life that enabled him to live extraordinarily ordinary life is that he chose courage. And we need to choose courage. Joseph wasn't only a man of character. He was also a man who lived courageously. And oftentimes when we look at scripture, we see this idea that courage and fear are kind of at the opposite end of things. Like that it's impossible for us to live in fear, to be ruled by fear, to allow fear to kind of dictate our decisions, what we do, where we go, what we say, and, and at the same time live courageously. They're at, they're at war with each other. They're opposite of each other. And I think that's why the angel starts, when he, when he starts talking to Joseph in the dream, the first thing that he says is, do not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid to go through with your plans of marrying Mary, right? Do not be afraid to do it because he probably was dealing with a lot of fears in that moment. Just think about some of the fears you would be dealing with in that moment. These are probably just some of the fears. The fear of what people would think. The fear of how people would treat them. The fear of losing his reputation that he worked hard to build. The fear of of his good name being ruined. The fear of how this would affect his future. Not just the here and now, but how would this decision affect his entire future? The fear of if he he didn't marry her and she was left to be this, this unwed mother, how would her life turn out? What would she have to deal with because of this? There was so many fears that he was probably dealing with and so many more that he was dealing with in that moment. To walk this out, to walk out in obedience, what the angel was telling him to do would require courage. And I think we can learn a couple things about courage from this situation, from Joseph's life. The first thing is this, is that courage is developed and tested in the midst of crisis and difficult decisions. Courage is is developed and tested when we are in the midst of crisis and difficult decisions. Just think for a moment. Joseph, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And he's, he's come to a place where he's going to try to do the right thing, but in the right way to marry. So he's settled on a quiet divorce. That's the plan he's going to have. And then the angel shows up after he kind of settled on this. And, I, and I'm, pro- I'm pretty sure that he probably still had some doubts on what the right decision to make was in this moment. And then an angel shows up with a different plan, which made me think, wouldn't it have been a lot easier if the angel just showed up like a couple days earlier? Right? Like, just imagine how much easier this whole thing would have worked out. It still would have been hard. But can you imagine if the angel would have just showed up like a few days earlier while, while Mary was still visiting her relative and showed up and said, listen, Joseph, your world is about to be rocked, right? Like, this is a, there, there's about to be something that happens that throws you completely off. But listen, I want you to understand, it is all from God. That this miracle of Mary, she's pregnant, and she hasn't been cheating on you. She hasn't been sleeping around with other guys. She's still a virgin, and, and this baby is from God. He's going to be the, the Messiah. He is the one that the Bible preaches about. He's going to save people from their sins. Have not, no fear. It would have been so much easier if he would have known ahead of time. But is, the truth is, that's not often how God works, is it? That's not often how God works. He doesn't often reveal his entire plan to us before we have a chance to step out in courage. Because it wouldn't take courage to step into a plan when we already knew how everything was going to work out. It's during that season of wrestling for Joseph. During that season of wrestling with what the right decision to make was. During that season of of not knowing, that, that season of crisis, that season of difficult decision where his courage, his ability to walk into courage was being grown inside of him. It was being developed inside of him. And that's how it works in our life as well. The second thing I, I think we can learn about courage through this story is that courage is about doing the right thing, not the easy thing. Right? It's about doing the right thing, not the easy thing. And often, if we're honest, those things are not the same. You know what the easy thing would have been in this situation? To just divorce her. To break off their engagement, their betrothal, and just end the relationship. It would have been hard for a moment because he loved her and cared about her. But it would have been the much easier thing to do for him in the long term. Now, he could have saved face. He could have kept his reputation. He might have even grown his reputation, right? Because he's a righteous man, and he was known as a righteous man, and he's still a righteous man. He did the right thing, but he's also a man that's full of mercy and compassion. He is like right up there with it's like God, Joseph, right? Like there are team, team one and two, right? He is the perfect person because he is full of, of justice, but he's also full of mercy. He could have saved face, built his reputation. He could have married somebody else who, who he could have had his own children with by blood. Like he could have done the easy thing, and which would have been... To simply divorce her. But it took courage to do the right thing. And courage isn't always about doing the easy thing. It's about doing the right thing. The angel appears and tells him the right thing for him to do is to continue on with the engagement. To betroth, to be married to Mary. To take her as his wife. To, to allow her to have this baby. And then to adopt this baby as his own son. And to choose to name him Jesus. Because he is meant to save his people from their sins. I heard somebody say it like this. And I thought this really was a, a good way of looking at it. So Joseph was a righteous man, and he was a righteous man who now faced shame. Everybody knew he wasn't the real father of Mary's firstborn son. Right? We know this is a small town. Small town, people talk. Everybody knows each other's business, right? Have you ever been in a small town where everybody knows everybody? Everybody knows everybody's story. 
The gossip would have been there. Everybody would have known the situation. And they would have known that Joseph was not the father of this baby. They must have thought that he was crazy to believe that she was still a virgin. Those who heard the story undoubtedly thought he, he, he was either a fool to believe what Mary said or that he was a liar who was covering up his own role in the pregnancy. He was trying to save face. He was a righteous person. And so he just made Mary lie about it because he didn't want to look bad. Either way, it was kind of a lose. It would have been so much easier to simply divorce her, to humiliate her, to make a public spectacle of her, blame her for sleeping around. But he refused to do it because he loved her too much and he loved God too much. And so instead of disgracing her, he took disgrace upon himself. He protected her. He believed her. He believed God. And let me tell you, that took great courage. That took greater courage than we can even comprehend or understand. To live an extraordinarily ordinary life requires courage. The courage to do the right thing, not the easy thing. Which is the type of courage that is developed and strengthened in the midst of crisis and difficult situations. Which is where it's hard for us. Because let's be real. We like easy stuff, don't we? How many of you would be honest and say, if you had your way and you could prefer in your life, that you would never go through anything difficult? I mean, I don't know about you, but I prefer good days worse, better than bad days. I prefer when I go through a day and don't have any tension in my family versus when there's lots of tension. I prefer when I go through a day and there's no trials versus the day that is full of trials. I think we, we do that because we like comfort. That's just who we are, right? Like we, we like to be comfortable. We like the easy thing. But what we learn throughout Scripture is that there's nothing wrong with, with having a good day that's comfortable at times. What we learn in Scripture, what we see in this story, is that often the, the greatest growth we have in our lives, the greatest things that God develops in our life, aren't developed on the mountaintops that we go through. They're often in the valleys. They're often in the difficult seasons, the hard times. And we are so quick to avoid those difficult times because we don't like going through painful times. But what we understand and we see throughout Scripture is that most of our greatest growth in our spiritual walk takes place in the hard things, in the valleys. In fact, in James chapter 1, 2, and 4, it says it like this. It says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. That God grows us, grows our courage, grows our endurance, matures our faith, not in the easy things, but in the difficult things. And then the last thing we see about Joseph being a person who lived an extraordinarily ordinary life is this. He was also compliant. Compliant. I mean, I know that word is kind of a weird word. It kind of feels like a word that we shouldn't want to be, right? In fact, by definition, compliance is obeying, obliging, or yielding, especially in a submissive way. And I think many of us struggle with this because we want to be the leaders of our own life, don't we? We want to be the, the people who direct every step of our own life. I'm in charge. I make my decisions. I do what I want to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And so we, we kind of carry that around as like a, a badge of honor. I'm the leader of my life. But what we see in the story of Mary is that she was obedient. We see the same thing in the story of Joseph, that he was compliant, meaning he was open and submissive to whatever it is that God wanted him to do. And really, if you think about it, uh, godly compliance is really just what takes place in our lives when it's the result of blending godly character and godly courage. When, we're, when we are a person of godly character and we have strong convictions and we are striving to be who God wants us to be, we have godly character in our lives and we also have the courage to, to step into the difficult things that often God wants to bring us through. When we have those two things, the natural overflow of that, the natural result of that is that we will live godly compliance. We'll have a mindset that we are just simply submitted to it, whatever it is that God wants to do. God, if this is where you're leading me, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's difficult, even if it's a harder decision, it's not the easy road, then I'll walk through it because I trust you. It's the natural overflow of these things. And we see this in Joseph's life. Look at verse 24 and 25 one more time. It says, when Joseph woke up after hearing this dream, what did he do? He did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Jesus. 
want you to see, before the angel shows up, what was he doing? He was wrestling with the decision. He didn't know what to do. He was confused about what to do. He wasn't sure what to do. He was going back and forth with what the right decision was. And then the angel shows up and gives him a word of the, from the Lord, tells him exactly what to do. And what did Joseph do when he got up from the dream? He did exactly what the angel told him to do right away. He, he, he did it exactly as the angel said to do right away. Why? Because Joseph understood something that I think all of us need to understand when it comes to obedience. Delayed obedience is the same as disobedience. When we know what God tells us to do, but we, we don't do it when we're supposed to do it, that's the same as being disobedient. And Joseph practiced complete submission, compliance to what God wanted him to do right there. Right away after waking up, he puts the plan into practice. He marries her. He continues the plan. He does what, what God is calling him to do. I want you to see, as we look at what he did, it just testifies to this heart of, of submission to God's will. He marries her quickly, and by doing that, he broke all of the Jewish customs at that time. But he also did it in a way that would protect her reputation. Because she was pregnant, and he wasn't the father, but he chose to marry her anyway. What Joseph willingly did there was he, chose, he willingly accepted the stigma and, and all of the, 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 people, the things that people were going to say about him in this situation. So he could obey the Lord and provide legitimacy, respectability, and protection to Mary and her son. The second thing he did, which I think we miss really easily in this, is, is by keeping her aversion until Jesus was born, he protected, he protected the miracle of Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit against slander of unbelievers. Now think about the self-control that took. He was now officially married. They had had the ceremony. He could have experienced his marital rights, so to speak. They could have enjoyed married life. She's already pregnant anyway, right? Like, and so he could have enjoyed marital life there, but he chose... Because he was a man of self-control, he chose to not sleep with her for another six months after they were married until the baby was born. Because he wanted to make sure that everybody understood that this was a miracle of God. That this was God's plan. He didn't want to interfere or mess up God's plan in any way. And then the third thing, by naming the baby, he exercised a father's prerogative and thus officially took Jesus into his family as his own legal son. The naming of the child for the father was a big deal. It, it was, a, it was a, a father's right. And when Joseph did this, not only was he being obedient to God, but it was also the answer to prophecy. Because the Bible says that the Messiah would come from the, the line of David, the kingly line of David. And that's the line of Joseph. And by adopting him into the family... It was a fulfillment of prophecy that he would not be from the, the, the blood of Joseph, the flesh of Joseph, but he would be from the, the line of Joseph. And if you dig deeper into that, and we don't have time to talk about it, this is truly an answer to prophecy. Because if you look in the book of, of Luke, you'll see another genealogy that's slightly different, and it's the genealogy of Mary. And what you'll find out is that Mary also came from the line of David, but not from the kingly line of David. So he actually, Jesus was actually the, partly from the flesh of, of the line of David as well. It's so much that there's so much deeper stuff that is there that we could even get into. But it's a fulfillment of, of prophecy. And what we see here also is that Joseph is painting for us and modeling for us what the heart of adoption looks like. He adopted Jesus in, and he was fully his son. He raised him, he taught him, he showed him and modeled for him what it looked like to live righteously, what it looked like to live surrendered to God, what it looked like to follow God's commands. And the crazy thing is, this heart of compliance, of submitting to God's will, you know, this was not the, the only time that we see this lived out in Joseph's life. In the short amount of time that we, we read about Joseph, we see this is the first of four times that an angel appears to him and speaks to him in a dream where he listens. And he submits even when it's difficult. A little bit later, we read that King Herod, in Matthew, we read that King Herod is going to try to kill all of the babies because, he, because Jesus is a threat to his throne, right? What he thinks is his throne. And so Herod puts in a plan in place to kill all of the firstborn males. And in a, a dream in the middle of the night, an angel appears to Joseph again and says, you need to get out of Dodge, right? Like, you need to leave Bethlehem. You need to go to Egypt, which was like a 700-mile journey, right? Like, I look at 700 miles, that's like further than I drive when I go down to, to Myrtle Beach. And so in my mind, it's like, that's like an like 11 or 12 hour drive going 95 miles per hour, 95. I don't know what that is in camel time, um, but let's just agree it's a lot of time. Like, he, he took a long journey, and the Bible says that when he got this message, he woke up his wife and woke up Jesus in the middle of the night, packed him up, and left in obedience 
going to a, a land that they knew nothing about to be obedient. And then the time came for them to move back. The angel spoke again. And instead of going, we're pretty comfortable here in Egypt. We got a nice house going on. We got a nice life here. He obediently took them, moved them back to Judah. And at, right before they're about to get settled into where they wanted to live in Judah, an angel appeared to them in a dream again and said, move back to Nazareth, which was also a fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible says that he would be known as a Nazarene, talking about Jesus. All of these steps of obedience all happened because Joseph was compliant and obedient to God's plan. He followed God's plan even when it was difficult. You see, when you look at Joseph, Joseph wasn't chosen by God because he was the smartest. He wasn't chosen by God because he was the richest or the most famous. Joseph was chosen by God because he was a, a yes man. He was a man who was willing to say yes to God's plans, no matter if it made sense, no matter if it, was a perf it, it, it required sacrifice for him. He simply wanted to do whatever it is that God wanted him to do. And again, I want to remind you this morning that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. What that means is that you don't have to be the center of attention. You don't have to be in a starring role or whatever you feel like the world says you need to be used by God or to be important. You don't need any of those things. But what we see in this story, what we see throughout all of Scripture, is that God can greatly use and has greatly used quiet, steady, faithful people, men and women of conviction and character, men and women who live lives that are courageous, and men and women who will simply say yes to God's plan, even when it's difficult. Would you stand with me as we close today? We're going to close this morning in, in a time of worship. And, uh, and before we do that, I just want us to take just a moment and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us in this moment. And so would you just close your eyes for a moment. I want to speak to, to somebody in here today that feels forgotten. I want to speak to, to somebody in here today that, that feels unworthy. That feels unseen. That maybe feels like they've messed up too much. They've done too much wrong to be used by God. I want to speak to the person today who, who deals with insecurities. Who feels like they're never going to be enough. Because what I think we can learn from Joseph's life is that, that God is in the business of, of using ordinary people. And that God is able to do immeasurably more, the Bible says in Ephesians. He's able to do immeasurably more than all we hope, dream, or imagine according to his power at work in us. It's not about what we bring to the table. It's not about what we have to offer. It's about his power at work in our weaknesses. And for those of you who are here today that maybe feel that way about yourself, I want you to understand that the greatest way for you to live an extraordinary life isn't by finding a bigger stage or by making yourself more important in the world's eyes. But it's by, by being a greater servant. Like you don't have to be extraordinary in the world's eyes. Because God uses ordinary people. And he does extraordinary things. And if that's you today, how do you make room for God to do an extraordinary thing in and through your life? Well, you do what Joseph did. You start by being a person of character. You know what's not ordinary? It's not ordinary to live for Jesus. It's not ordinary to live with strong character. It's not ordinary to have strong convictions. To live a set-apart life. To live differently because of your commitment to Christ. That's not ordinary. So start there. Submit your life to God. Build your life on the foundation of his word. And then be a person that chooses courage over fear, which means not avoiding trials and not avoiding difficult things, but embracing it. Embrace the pain. Embrace the trials. Embrace the difficult things in your life. Know that God is working in your brokenness. God is developing in you in the midst of that difficult thing. He's developing in you his character. He's developing in you his courage so that you can step out into courage and whatever the step is that he wants you to take. And be a person who embraces God's plans. Be a person who will say yes to him, yes to God, be compliant with his will, submit to his will, even when it doesn't make sense and even when it's difficult.
Father, today, Lord, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. God, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy in our lives. God, I thank you for your word where we see examples like Joseph. God, in many ways, the, a little bit of a forgotten man in the story, yet somebody that you used mightily, that you did extraordinary things in and through. Not because he was the most talented or he had the most to offer, but simply because he said yes to you. He lived a life of quiet obedience, lived righteously, had convictions, lived for you. He was a man who lived courageously. He didn't just do the easy thing. He did the right thing. And God, he was a, a man who said yes to your plan. He didn't delay, God. He obeyed you right away. God, let that be what we're known for. Let us be known as people who live for you, who live our lives on the foundation of your word, who live different. Let us be people who live courageously, who don't settle for the easy thing, but will do whatever it takes, even if it's difficult. And God, let us be people who, who are open to your plans. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close today in worship, at the end of worship, we're going to invite our, our prayer partners up here. And I just want to encourage you, if you're here today and there's things going on in your life, you need prayer, I want to invite you to, to come up and to pray with somebody. Don't be afraid. Don't allow your, your fear. In this moment, I think sometimes we, we get afraid to step out because what are people going to think? What are people going to say if I step out and I, I go get prayer? And I would just encourage you, don't allow your fear of what anybody thinks to get in the way of, of prayer, to get in the way of spending time in God's presence. That's what we're here for. And I know that we want to be used mightily by God. So as we close in worship today, if that's you and you need to take some time and you want to pray with somebody, please take the time to do that. But let's enter into God's presence right now.